Next on Garden Line, tagging along with a group of South Dakota master gardeners in Europe, planting annuals to attract butterflies, called the butterfly bush, and transplanting tips. And roots will form all the way along. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight we're going to go to Saratoma Butterfly House in Sioux Falls and learn which annual annuals attract butterflies. We'll also return to the greenhouse to learn tips where and when transplanting seedlings. And we will feature the South Dakota Master Gardeners trip to some famous gardens in three lovely European locations, London, Edinburgh, and Amsterdam. Join us in the studio tonight to answer your questions are Casey Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences, Chris Dorostoff, Extension Horticulture Educator, Mike Meckning, Extension Weed Specialist, and John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. The phone number for you tonight to call in is 1-866-595-SDSU. Once again, that is 1-866-5957-3767. Now helping to answer the phones tonight are the friends of GardenLine. Please provide them with as much detail as you can when you call in to help solve your problem that you're calling in for. Where it first appeared and perhaps some of the surrounding plants uh, when you answer that question. Before we get to our questions, however, last week GardenLine visited with Rhoda Burroughs, Extension Horticulturalist, in a greenhouse where she showed us some different examples of seedling, seedling plants. Now, we rejoin Rhoda in that greenhouse for tips to transplanting those seeds. Good evening. We're back at the SDSU Horticulture Greenhouses again. And again, you can see the McCrory Gardens bedding plants in the background. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about transplanting. We talked last week about how to select transplants. And uh, this week, I'd like to show you a couple of tips that you can use for uh, plants that have sort of gotten out of hand. Um, normally with our transplants, when we transplant, we want to just take it, put it into the same soil line it was before right there. But uh, this time we're going to go do something a little bit different with tomatoes. First of all, I'll back up and talk a little bit about artificial media. If you're using a containerized media with peat in, Sometimes the peat will be very dry. You open it up and you get this dust of peat dust. If, you, if your peat is like that, you want to either wear a dust mask or just open up the bag a little bit and pour in water and work it in first because it's really not good for you to breathe that dust. So first thing I'm going to do is work water in. And one of the things you need to do is kind of work that in with your hand and make sure that it gets worked in evenly because you'll have pockets of dry peat otherwise that just may not take up the water very well. So you want to make sure that that's good and worked in. With tomatoes we have this little tip. Tomatoes have little root initials all along the stem. So we can actually take a tomato that's long and skinny like this and we can lay it in sideways or straight down and cover up that stem and roots will form all the way along wherever it's covered up. So that's a good way to handle those tomatoes that just got a little bit too tall. Now often we'll see towards the end of the transplant season you'll get a transplant like that with roots just very tightly packed. If we take this and put it right in the soil like this, especially if it's not a potting mix, but regular soil. These roots have a hard time moving out into the soil. So what we want to do is be a little nasty with this and just break that up gently. 
and that will help those roots move out into the surrounding soil. Now this is a mint, so once it's transplanted, you could also just go ahead and clip off the top. And this will branch out very nicely then. Good. Well, we thank Rhoda for those tips on planting. And tonight we're also going to go around the table here for the topic of the week, or the round table. Casey? Yeah. What do you have for us? Um, I'd like to, to start off talking about a, a bird this week. Mike always has the weed of the week. And, and so uh, this week I've, I've uh, brought in uh, some information on a kind of a weed in the bird world. It's the Eurasian collared dove. And this is a bird that uh, is native to uh, uh, it's kind of the southern parts of Asia and has now uh, expanded. Uh, it was in some cages in Bahamas, got loose, and dispersed into Florida in the early 1980s. And by 1997, we had them here in South Dakota. They're very good dispersers. And now we have them in, in uh, every uh, town and city in the state. The way you identify these birds is they're light, they're very light colored. Sometimes people describe them almost as white. And they have a long square tail. And then they have that distinctive black collar around the back. And uh, the next slide will show you kind of the expansion here in South Dakota. Uh, you can see since the year 2000, the, the population growth has been nearly exponential. And now, like I said before, I, every town I've looked for them here in the state, I've found them in. Uh, you can tell them apart from the native morning dove, which is the, which is the next slide that you'll see. Uh, the morning doves are grayer, and then they have a pointed tail. Um, <clears throat> you also can tell them apart by their calls. Uh, some people describe it as a morning dove with a smoker's cough. <laughs> um, uh, at any rate, if, if you live in uh, any of the cities in South Dakota and you feed birds, you're very likely to see uh, this species visiting your feeder. So it gives you an idea of uh, what, what you've got coming in. Anything they can do about it or just it's here not to really, stay? Or? Not really. Uh, they're here to stay. The State Department of Game, Fish, and Parks treats them much the same as they do pigeons, which are also uh, escape non-native birds. and so. Uh, they're kind of an open season in terms of trapping them, uh, getting rid of them, or, or whatever that you decide to try to do with them. Okay. Thank you, Casey. Yeah. Chris, what do you have for us this week? Well, we've had a, a number of calls on powdery mildew the last few days. Um, how you identify it is on the leaf blade, you'll see a white powdery substance uh, following by maybe a yellowing, and then uh, the turf may brown up on you. Susceptible uh, varieties include your bluegrasses and your finely fescues in the shady parts of your yard. Areas maybe that don't have good air circulation or have a lot of moisture sitting around in those areas. As far as control, um, consider maybe your hedges are, are, are shading the area uh, a lot. You could possibly prune those shrubs back in the dormant season in March. Um, try maybe not watering that area as much. Try uh, avoiding uh, excess nitrogen because this succulent growth is quite susceptible. We don't really recommend fungicides because really you're not curing the problem. What you want to do is look for some uh, varieties out there with resistance built in and overseed those areas. Uh, put maybe a half pound of, of seed over that grass area in the fall and work it in and then hopefully in time you'll have less of a problem in that part of your yard. Okay, thank you. Mike? Yeah. What do you have for well, it? Well, not really a weed tonight. I mean, it could be a weed if you want to consider it a weed, but it's kind of a plant uh, that you might see flowering right now, and that's Dame's Rocket. Here we have a, a picture here. Eventually, we'll, we'll show up a slide of Dame's Rocket. Uh, it's a real nice purple flower type plant. Sometimes people uh, confuse it with purple loosestrife, but purple loosestrife will flower much later in the summer. So this is an early flowering plant. In fact, this is kind of a mustard species. Uh, in the next picture here, we'll see that we can tell it's a mustard species by the four leaf petals. That's one characteristic of, of that family. Family used to be called the cruciferae family for the crucifix or the cross, which is kind of uh, indicated by those cross-like petals on those flowers. So nice purple flowers on the dame's rocket. Last picture here, uh, we can kind of see it as, uh, you know, the, we'll see the flowers kind of alternating up the stem and, 
and uh, stick around maybe a little bit longer on the top, and then at the bottom we'll see some little seed pods starting to develop, which is also typical of mustard species. So some people consider it a weed. You know, you, like Wisconsin, the DNR, consider it to be an invasive species. South Dakota, I've, I've never really seen it really take off, so I'm not really sure that you really need to get concerned and controlling it. It's a pretty plant, so I guess this is a weed that we can kind of enjoy. So Dame's Rocket. Yeah, they say it's really starting to show up the last uh, week or so. Oh, you it's everywhere. Yeah. The ditches. It really likes to be along the edges of woods and that sort of thing, moist areas and that sort of thing. But not a big problem. I would just enjoy it. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. John, in the uh, forestry tree area. What's going on this week? Well, this week... Besides trying to keep them upright from, oh, compared well, to... Well, I know. It's, it's been windy, but hey, that's South Dakota. You know, what do you say? Uh, 70 miles an hour, a light breeze. Yeah. But uh, uh, one of the things that we've been getting a lot of calls on, I mean, just a lot today alone, um, is seed production. And, you know, people are calling up and they're saying... I mean, my favorite uh, ones we've been getting is on the... Um, ash trees because they now dropped a lot of their leaves because of ash anthracnose, the fungus disease that I'm sure everybody's aware of by now, but that shows all the uh, seeds that are hanging from it. And then the other one, uh, and that's, there's a good picture one right now, and that's the seed crop <laughs> from last fall on a female uh, ash tree. And of course now with ex, uh, the ash anthracnose you can really see it. Now the next picture ought to show the real, well that's kind of out of order, but it doesn't matter. That's another problem we're seeing related to a fungus disease. That's peach leaf curl. Now, this is like ash anthracnose. It's a foliar disease. It came about because we had that, that little period of wet, cool weather. And normally, I don't see this till June. Uh, but we're seeing this in May now on peach leaves. And of course, the question everybody asks is, well, what do I spray? Nothing. Uh, because you'd have to treat this in the bud stage. Uh, and so you need to get back in your time machine and go backwards till about uh, April. And as the bud's expanding, spray it with lime sulfur. Do not, do not, do not spray it with lime sulfur now. Uh, you'll actually take the rest of the leaves off. Uh, so that's a spray you do right at the beginning. But uh, uh, some of the other trees we're having, uh, silver maples are dropping their little helicopters right now. And that's leaving a big gap in the branches. That's where, ah, there we are. There's those little helicopters. And uh, that leaves a gap then in the branches that people say, w w what's missing? Well, all the seeds have fallen. And then the last picture, and this is a great one if they've got this one up, it's on Siberian elms. And, oh, that's not a Siberian elm. My <laughs> gosh, where did that come from? Well, that'd be a very bizarre looking Siberian elm. But, <laughs> but Siberian elms were getting calls on too. People are, I, I, first of all, I'm surprised. People are worried their Siberian elms are dying, uh, what people call Chinese elms. And I'm looking at, is that a problem? But uh, I, I got this picture in today, and they said, all the leaves are becoming rounded and turning white. Those are seeds. And so we're getting a tremendous seed production on those trees right now, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a banner year for seeds on those plants. And again, it may just be because of the cool weather we had, but it's incredible this year. I was going to say, in some cases, I think people are a little surprised for as cool uh, of weather that we actually had, thinking the frost maybe damaged some of those. No. The flowers really did come through. And yeah, it, because these are really tough plants. I mean, these are plants that are used to flowering fairly early. They're spring flowering plants. They produce seeds very quickly. So they are very frost tolerant. You're absolutely right. Uh, these can handle that. So. And we love, I think, in our 4-H's to, uh, to look at those maple leaf, or seeds as they come down in the aerodynamic ability that they have to nice flutterly come down and the heavy part is the seed part which goes right to the ground and get ready to, yep. to germinate. And the other odd thing with those with silver maples is if you save that seed it will not germinate. It has to germinate within a week. Wow. And so it's got to get on the ground, germinate right away. If you picked them all up and stored them for some reason and planted them two weeks or three weeks from now, nothing would germinate. Wouldn't work at all. Yeah, so. It's got to come up right away. Okay. Well hey, leading into our featured garden of the week. I understand you had the opportunity to take some master gardeners across the big pond. That's right, and a detour around a volcano or two, but nevertheless, uh, yes, we just got back from about uh, almost a two-week trip uh, to the UK and to the Netherlands, and it was just a delight. Uh, a lot of people here might be surprised to find that the weather was very similar to what we're seeing here, and that is the crab apples were in bloom, uh, the lilacs were in bloom. But of course, over there, we had a lot of other plants that were in bloom as well, rhododendrons and such. And so, and every day we visited a garden, it was beautiful, sunshiny weather. So it was just a delight. Good. 
Well, as we mentioned, the Garden of the Week will be some of the gardens that uh, John and the Master Gardeners visited uh, while on their trip. The Royal Botanical Gardens in, in Edinburgh, Scotland. The Royal Botanical Gardens, the Kew, commonly known as Kew Gardens in London. So here we are with the Gardens of the Week. All right, good. Hey, some beautiful, beautiful sights there, John. So it was fantastic. And that's something that happens once a year or every other year. Or? No, uh, probably every year. Next year we're looking at going to Scandinavian gardens because okay. we're we got a lot of Norwegian heritage here. So we're going to go to Oslo and then uh, Sweden and also Finland, see some northern gardens. So if they're in, the master gardeners, con if they're interested, they can contact you for next year then, perhaps. Absolutely. Okay, good. But hey, we're here to answer some questions. And uh, so let's get right to that uh, this, after, or this evening. So, First question that I have here, what is the correct time of year to transplant peonies? Also, can the plants be broken apart for more plants? Okay. You want to do that one, Chris? Sure. Okay. Yep. Uh, peonies, what we recommend is to do it in the fall. Uh, prune, prune them down near the ground. Lift up that plant, trying not to r ruin the root system. As far as then dividing it up, um, break them into clumps with a sharp knife. Have about three to five buds per clump. Take that clump to a, a sunny, well-drained location and then uh, backfill it in there. Now the, the key is the, the right depth. Uh, we want those peony buds to be maybe an inch to two inches deep. Any deeper you'll have a problem with flowering, so make sure you're not too deep. Um, the other point would be then uh, in the fall, do mulch that plant, it'll be a little more tender. Uh, in November, put two to four inches of mulch on and in the spring get that mulch off of there before uh, the plant starts to leaf out on you. Uh, don't be surprised that first year if, uh, if it doesn't flower extremely well for you, but, but it should pick up by the second year or so. Good, thank you. The next one, my hosta bed is being taken over by slugs, what is the best safe thing that I can use besides stale beer? Fresh beer? Fresh beer? Fresh beer. <laughs> Staler. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, you, you can't even just take just a little piece of cardboard or something that they can get underneath and then just pick that up in the morning and go mm -hmm. <laughs> Physically <laughs> remove it. Physically remove it. Okay. Uh, but seriously, it'll work. Just, yeah. just give, put something they can hide underneath, piece of cardboard. You don't okay. need to give them beer. They like beer. You put beer underneath the cardboard. You now have drunk slugs. <laughs> yeah. But, but they'll, they'll, they'll congregate under something like that. You can just pick it up and throw it away in the morning. Okay. Make sure you pick it up and throw it away. Otherwise, what you're doing is providing just a little home for the slugs. Okay. There's a product, too, on the market that's uh, iron phosphate is considered fairly safe. It's found naturally in the soil, and it's, it's labeled to be safe for humans, pets, wildlife. You uh, can put it down in the area, and uh, it'll stay there for about two weeks. Okay, good. I understand the stale part of it is actually something that works better than fresh. But is that right? I don't I, that's what I've heard. So. It's a stale so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't take long for that to happen. Next question. We have three apple trees uh, planted quite closely together. An early summer apple, a Harrelson, and honey gold. We have never really received nice apples from either the Harrelson or the honey gold. The apples all have rough brown specked spots on them. What causes this, and is there, is there anything we can do to help prevent that? John, is that something you can help us with? Yeah, I might be able to, and I'll, I'll have to say the, the best thing they can do is really this year send a sample of fruit. And the reason for that is what they're describing could be a number of things. There's a, there's a little thing called brown speck or fly speck which is mostly just on the surface. You can scrape that off with a knife. But if they're saying dimpling as well, that might be apple maggot. 
So the symptoms that they've described actually fit a number of problems, and there's nothing saying they just have one. So I, I really suggest when you get the fruit this year is to send one to your local cooperative extension agent, and they'll pass it on to, to myself, for example. We'll take a look at it and give you a, a proper diagnosis then. So the following year you can treat it. it. At this point, most of the things we'd be treating for, with the exception of apple maggot, you'd already need to have treated. So you're not going to be that far behind the game. So get us a sample. That'll help. Okay. Well, we got a number of tree-related ones here, John, so we'll just keep you right on uh, home plate here. I need to remove a dead con uh, coniferous tree, no idea what it is, and would like to replace it with another tree or several shrubs in the same location. What is the proper way to remove a tree stump, and is there anything I need to look for that would indicate disease is present in the root system or soil that I need to be concerned about? All right, where are they from? They are from Wagner. Oh, okay. Well... Oh, and many thanks. They really love the show. Oh, well, that's great. That's great. Uh, well, first of all, the, the best way to get rid of the stump is to have it ground out, and uh, the, that's why I asked where. And, and they're in a location large enough that there's going to be a stump grinding service nearby. And what they usually do is they measure it by the inch, and they'll come in and grind it out, and then you fill in the hole with topsoil, and, and off you go. And surprisingly, you can plant your new tree very close to that location. I've done that on campus and they actually do quite well. But he, they did bring up a, one concern, and that is if the tree died of a root disease. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of serious ones, particularly in their area. Uh, there is armillary shoestring root rot, but we see more of the problems with that really out in the hills. So I wouldn't be all that concerned about uh, a root disease, particularly with a conifer, more than likely died from something on the top, and they could probably go back and plant something relatively close to that. But, yeah. but Grind out the stump. Don't use the products that you pour on it to have the stump disappear, and not unless you're looking at a 10-year time period for disappearance. They really don't work. Grind it. I say a number of times with the conifers, um, there's a question as far as is my soil acidic and do I need to do anything with it? No, 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 no. This is not. South Dakota. You know, yeah. our soils are alkaline. That's, okay. Even that isn't going to make it acidic enough. And they had a quick follow-up question as far as uh, your new tree book. Wondering when that might be available, or if it is available, or boy, if it was available, I'd be I'd be <laughs> dancing in the streets, all right. So, uh, but uh, they're getting the picture scanned and that, so we got to be getting pretty darn close. Believe me, we'll tell you here. <laughs> it's in the process, all yeah, right. It is. So, okay. Uh, from Pierre, Chris, this year I was unable to plant my garden as usual, but I would like to plant a cover crop to benefit the soil. What crop would you recommend, and when should I plant that? I live in Central South Dakota, uh, Pierre, of course, but. I'm not sure. Are we all that much too late? Well, really? I don't think necessary. You might have to get a little irrigation to get it started. But I mean, the concept is good because the cover crop's going to help uh, hold that nutrients there so it doesn't leach away in the soil. It's going to help the soil from running off. Uh, it will um, cover up the soil so we don't get weed growth. I would say get it in immediately, especially if these hot temperatures are going to remain. Uh, you might have a little trouble getting it started. but. Your grass cover crops are going to provide you with that quick cover, and that's probably going to be your best route at this point. Um, maybe an annual ryegrass or, or a, a, a barley. Um, the, leg, the legume cover crops, what they do is provide some nitrogen to the soil, so there's a good benefit there, but they're a lot slower to get going. Um, for a legume, you could do a vetch or a crimson clover uh, would work. There's some variation, though, you know, if they're perennials or not. If they're a perennial, you may have a weed problem next year, so keep that in mind. And, and some things till uh, out a little harder than other things. So uh, if, you, if you have some specific uh, criteria, you might want to call, and we could have a conversation about it. Okay. But Mike, we, well, go ahead. Oh, yeah, one thing I would add, and we're kind of dabbling with that this year, uh, you can plant, if you plant like a winter wheat or a winter rye, if you plant it in the spring, it won't head out, it, you know, because they have to vernalize. They have to, you know, have that overwintering type period. So you could plant that now, and it would only grow maybe 8, 12 inches tall, and that's it. And then it would just stop. One thing we're even trying is planting that and then planting, like, tomatoes into that, you know, and, and using that to suppress the weeds. We're going to give that a shot this year. So, so that, a, a grass, a, as a grass option, that's annual, might be something to think about. Okay. I have one for you here, Mike. Uh... And this is from Chancellor. How do I get rid of patches of clover that are in my yard? Oh, you don't want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> you just don't. Go after those other weeds. Look around your yard. There's probably a dozen other weeds that are much worse uh, than the clover. In fact, I, early this spring, seeded white clover all over my yard. I spread the seed all over my yard, hoping that I can get some more white clover growing. 
Um, sometimes people say, well, you know, as Chris mentioned, it's a legume, and so it can help fix nitrogen. Well, maybe you can use that. You can just put more nitrogen on your yard. That'll get the grass more competitive, and that'll kind of suppress the white clover, so you might not see it so much. Um, but otherwise, if you really want to control it, sure, you could, uh, you know, you're going to have to spray it with the typical broadleaf herbicides, and you're probably going to have to spray it twice when so you do it once, and then you'd have to do it again and maybe two or three weeks later. Uh, it is kind of a tough weed to get, to, to get out if you want to, but it's really not that bad of a weed. It's not that invasive. It's adding nitrogen, and it gives you some green in the middle of the summer. I don't know. I'd recommend keeping it, but uh, if you want to spray it, Probably going to have to give it two shots spaced about uh, two weeks apart. And, and is that something new? It seemed like back in the 70s. We used to find that in seed mixes for lawn. Absolutely. Clover. And, and I've got clover in my yard, lawn, and I love it. But yes. it seems like last couple of years, people want to get rid of it. Well, but last, you know, maybe 20 years. Well, but, yeah. you know, 20 years. <laughs> last couple of Time goes fast yeah, when you're as old as me. <laughs> but uh, absolutely right. It used, to be, it used to be a symbol of a healthy lawn. Yeah. And absolutely, you want to diversify. That's why I say I seeded my yard because, you know, you get those shady areas. It's kind of shade tolerant, so it'll help fill Flowers in some of those gaps. Like yeah. It. So, well, I'd like I say, I'm seeding it and I'm trying to get it going in my yard. I don't know. All right. Uh, from Huron, and I'm not sure if this is really isolated to Huron, but uh, is anyone willing to answer the question as far as all the little gnats that are out there now when you're out working around the trees, the flower gardens, or the yard? I think it's probably the buffalo gnats that are yep, out there. And they're going to go yep. away. Yep. I mean, it's, that's not a new thing. You know, they, they pop up every year for about this time, for about three weeks. I can plan when I'm outside working. Uh, that I'm going to deal with those little gnats, and you're going to have a few get in your house, especially if you've got any holes in your screen, and then they're going to fade right out. So, I mean, one of the advantages of, of windy days at this time of year is that it helps cut the population while you're out working, but it's and, just a typical phenomenon. And they're widespread. I, yeah. I, this last week I've been from Elk Point out to Pier, and in the evenings, every, every place I've been, yeah. uh, they've been there. So. I think as things dry up, then they tend to drop off yeah. as far yep. as numbers. Yeah. So. Okay, John, here's one for you, and this is, I've seen this one before too, uh, and it's number four, I guess, as far as our pictures that we're going to show here on the screen. Uh, Australian pine planted four years ago, located 15 miles north of Sioux Falls, doing well. This year it has developed some multiple globules, as they say here, at the base of some of the candles. When touched, these globules distar discharge a dust, kind of pollen looking material. They're not breathing it, are they? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What is it, and uh, is there anything they should do about it? No, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you know, all those little seeds come from somewhere, and that's from pollen. And what you're looking at are the pollen cones. Uh, those are the male cones on a conifer, and they're very, con very visible right now in Austrian pines, ponderosa pines. And obviously, if you shake them at all, you're going to get the pollen release because all our conifers are wind pollinated, so it has to be very small pollen that's carried very far. So that's not a problem for your tree. That's just normal behavior for them. All right, you can't give them a vasectomy. Just just live with it. It'll, it'll 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 be over in a couple of weeks. But I do get every year we get calls. People say there's this dust coming out of my my uh, conifers. Well, that's normal. Yeah. They just add to that pollen count that they talk mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A uh, number of questions here from the Sioux Falls area. What are the most shade tolerant edible crops? Anybody have any idea on that one? Well, it, it uh, kind of depends on what you're looking for, but in a garden, you really do need a good 8 to 12 hours of sunlight for anything fruiting. Um, so I guess my advice would be stick to your leafy greens, uh, lettuces and mustards and beet greens. Um, you could do mushrooms, uh, though. The, watch the watch the borderline for hardiness there. But you can buy plugs and put them into logs. I don't know if John has experience with that. I'm going to attempt. Um, the other thing uh, I would say would be some of the woody plants, you know, elderberries and, and currants, and maybe John can add on to those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, elderberries and currants are good. They'll they'll take the shade. One problem is they will mildew, and you, you'll get powdery mildew in that on those. The mushroom thing, I think you're you're. I hope you're talking about. The legal, <laughs> of uh, the the mushrooms you drill a hole in yeah. the sataki mushrooms. The only problem with those, and and, and they are good. Um, they've been around for about 20 years in terms of marketing, but I, I just always go back to that caution. Don't eat anything, even if you're drilling holes into a log and putting the uh, putting the spores in there and growing the mushrooms. Make sure whatever's coming out of there you get identified because. 
more often than not, anything, any mushroom you eat is going to do a lot of harm than good. So just make sure you get identified. Once you get identified, I, I have no problems with it. They're, it's kind of like tasting, I don't know, eating a rubber mat. But <laughs> nevertheless, go ahead, do it. So, so maybe they can visit with their local extension office and be a little more... Um, Detailed as far as if they want berries or vegetables. Well, what about or strawberries? Are strawberries somewhat? No. I've had okay luck in my partially shaded garden yeah. with strawberries. But Boy, well, that's the problem. What's partial shade? Yeah. Be, right. Because that is a fruit. Absolutely. If you want bright, red, luscious uh, strawberries, you want to have a lot of sure. light. Um, you know, if you're getting like six hours of direct sunlight, I'd say you're okay. But you know, north side planting, Oh, yeah, you're going right. to get a lot of leaf to it. Yeah. You, you know, Chris is right. If, if she says, well, I've really got a shade garden here, what can I put? The, the two f woody fruit plants would be the Kern's gooseberries, either one of those, and el uh, elderberries. And elderberries will fruit very nicely in shade. So, you know, that, that would be a good choice. Okay. Thank you. Well, Garden Line traveled to Sioux Falls into the Saratoma Butterfly House with Mike Katangi, our extension entomologist. Mike highlighted several annuals that are adapted to South Dakota and are really good for attracting butterflies. Today we're going to talk about uh, plants that attract butterfly and we're here in the Sioux Falls Sertoma Butterfly House uh, to see which uh, plants the butterfly use as a source for nectar. And a common shrub here in South Dakota that folks plant to attract butterfly is this uh, uh, plant in here called the butterfly bush. And as you can see, it's got uh, small flowers uh, that the butterfly like to visit uh, as a source of nectar. Now, it's also called the summer lilac uh, or bodleia. And again, it's planted as a perennial here in the southeast part uh, of South Dakota. Now, uh, another uh, uh, plant that's here in the Sertoma butterfly house is uh, the lantana and uh, same thing it's got these uh, white small flowers I think the lantana will need to be planted here in South Dakota as an annual I don't think it will survive our cold winters but it can be planted as an annual now uh, the next plant is a colorful red plant it's uh, the hibiscus As you can see butterflies are attracted to the uh, bright color of the flower and uh, even though this plant is uh, the tropical variety that they use here in the Sertoma Butterfly House, we indeed have uh, something called a hardy hibiscus that can be planted in zone four. As you know, South Dakota is, is in zone four in terms of the hardiness uh, uh, index uh, for the United States. So uh, hibiscus, we have a hardy hibiscus that can be planted as a, a perennial. Okay, uh, this red plant in here, is called a, uh, a star flower or pentas uh, lanceolata. And as you can see, the same uh, redding, I mean, small flower, red in color, very attractive. Now, this plant will need to be planted as an annual. I don't think it will survive our winter here in South Dakota. So, again, star flower, small flowers that uh, butterflies like to visit for nectar. Now, the last plant I would like to talk about is this uh, blue plant in here. It's called a porter weed. And uh, it's got a small uh, uh, bluish flower. Uh, it's not, uh, it, it, it needs to be planted as an annual also because I don't think it will survive the winter if we leave it outdoors. So here in the butterfly house, we can learn what kind of plants the butterfly like. There are more plants in this area, but I'm afraid they are too tropical for use in South Dakota. But nevertheless, uh, some of the plants here can in fact be grown as a perennial like the, the butterfly bush. Uh, uh, or the hibiscus, uh, also as annual, like the star flower or the porter weed. So once again, we're here in the Sertoma Butterfly House visiting uh, uh, plants that uh, attract butterflies. Now next week, we'll talk about plants, uh, perennials that we can plant outdoors, more adapted to us here in South Dakota, and also plants that attract the caterpillar, for example, like the monarch. So that's going to be next week, continuing with our series of uh, plants that attract butterflies.
All right, so now we're back to the Q&A session of the, the show again. John, we have this, que this comment uh, from Brookings, or question from Brookings, where they purchased and planted a Japanese red maple in their front yard in October. It was very slow to leaf out this spring, and when it did, one main branch had no leaves. It is guaranteed for a year. What are the possibilities? Should I trim out the dead branches and hope for the best? Should I take a photo to the store and suggest that they honor the guarantee? I don't want to pull it and take it to the store if there's any chance that it will grow and survive. There's none. There? Uh, it's it's a, the Japanese maple, and occasionally I see them for sale at, uh, in the state but they aren't really even borderline hardy now. Now we do have a couple in Sioux Falls and we have some in Yankton, but uh, generally speaking that's a plant that's best left farther south, Omaha, or much farther east. And my suggestion would be that either they yank it out and say, look, I want my money back. Um, if they want to try to keep it, they can, but my guess is within the next couple of years it'll fade out. Entirely. I think we got a graphic picture of this. Would that uh, help? Sure, let's try it. The I think it's number two. Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. There it is. There we go. You know what? That looks a lot better than it should. Okay. I mean, to okay. give you an idea of, of the survival chances in the state. So, uh, and again, if you're someone from Yankton, you probably could get by with it a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, you know, and if someone says they really love those trees, plant the Korean maple. We've got them coming through in, in Brookings, and they have that very nice divided leaf. And it's a much hardier plant than the Japanese maples. Those are best left much farther south than east. So um, I'd say uh, yank it and get your money back. All right. Okay. KC, rabbits. Liquid fence to keep rabbits off the gardens. Do they really work? Well, um, I wish I could say they do. But, <laughs> but um, I've, I've not seen anything really that's good at excluding rabbits except for a fence. <laughs> You know, you can you can put up a, a fence and and keep the rabbits out, but uh, every other uh, remedy, kind of kind of uh, home remedy that I've seen or marketable remedy, it doesn't work too well. I'm uh, glad you said that because I, 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 the same product people ask about for their small woody plants, and mm -hmm. I've not really seen any effectiveness with rabbits. No. no. So um, you can you can fence them out or. Uh, you can get a live trap and trap them and relocate them or eat them. So <laughs> physical barriers by, by physical closer barriers to get to a guarantee. Yes. Yep. Okay. But it doesn't have to be that tall, does it? No. I mean, they're like any other wildlife. They usually are going for the easiest meal they can get. And so if you make it hard to get in the garden, they're, they'll likely go somewhere else. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, John DeSchmidt. Eight to ten years old, it's a spreading ewe, three times the original size and growing into the yard. Can they cut them back now? If not, when should they do that? This is a ewe? A ewe. Well, that's an evergreen for those that may not be aware of that. And evergreens do not respond well to heavy pruning. They're not like our deciduous plants where you can cut them back to two to three inches in the spring and let them come back. Unfortunately, those need to be sheared every year. And shearing means removing only a portion of the new growth. So the growth that forms this year, you could cut that back by half. But that means you've also let it grow a little bit every year. So I'm afraid, really, if the U is larger than what they want it to be, their only remedy, really, is just to remove the plant. Cutting it back is going to kill it as, as well. So uh, with evergreens, it's important to keep them sheared so you control that size growth rather than letting them get big and then say, well, I need to make them small again. It just won't happen with your evergreens. Okay. Uh, John, once again, last year they bought two pear trees, both Wisconsin something, question mark, question mark, as far as, I guess, the variety. Uh, they live in northwest Iowa, near Minnesota border. Wonder, uh, wonder better variety, I guess, is what, a variety for the area. Wonder which is better for the area, I think, is, is what the question is here. Trees look dead. Uh, they were five to six feet when bought them last year, planted open, sparse, uh, Near a walnut tree is 30 feet away. Uh, would that be a problem to that, those trees? You know, that was, a, that was a good point when they mentioned the walnuts. And walnuts do produce a toxin called juglones through the root system and through their leaves, which interferes with the growth, stunts the growth of conifers mostly. And then uh, crop, solanaceae crops like potatoes, tomatoes, and such, if you have those near. It would not really affect the pear tree. The problem with the pear trees, and I don't know the variety they're talking about, but the problem with the pear trees 
is that pears are borderline hardy, many of the cultivars are. If they really want to try pears, uh, the, um, the summer crisp pear out of Minnesota is just a, an excellent pear. And luscious and gourmet from South Dakota are also very good pears. Uh, Parker and Patton. Patton's probably the, the better choice there. But uh, the summer crisp I really like. It's, it's more of a red pear, not quite, uh, almost round rather than the typical pear shape. And of course our two from South Dakota are, are, are good pears as well. But that's another problem. When, when I go a, a lot to garden centers, or, or, or where people are selling plants at least, uh, you'll see an awful lot of pears which are not really hardy for this area as well as Japanese maples and those sort of things that if those plants could walk they'd all be leaving the state. And so you got to be very very careful when you're selecting plant materials. There's an awful lot that comes into the state that isn't hardy for the state including northwestern Iowa too, so okay. be careful. All right, thank you. Casey, and uh, actually we've had a couple of calls like this at our office. Barn swallows trying to build a nest outside the back door. What are your recommendations to keep them away or to remove the nest? Or? Yeah, you, you need to be just as persistent as the swallows are. And uh, <laughs> uh, so as, as they're, they're building it up, they're, they're collecting mud and building this nest up. And it, just every day you need to remove that. And eventually they'll get the idea. Um, you can also, uh, generally if it's above a door, there's a ledge there that they're building that on and you can do a little bit of carpentry and either remove the ledge or put a board above it so, that, so the ledge disappears and then they'll go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need, just need to be as persistent as they are and keep at it because if, if they complete the nest and then they start laying eggs, then you feel bad because then you're, you're destroying a nest that's already kind of under progress, so I, I would just say be persistent. Uh, make sure you just keep knocking that down every day. And and I don't have any better. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer than that. But Are there any problem with leaving them? No, there's no problem with leaving them, uh, other than that they they make a they poop in front of your door. Yeah, yeah well, I'm yeah. Not, but they're beneficial. I would. They're imagine. very beneficial. I have several barn swallow nests on my house, and one of them's over my basement door, which I don't use a lot, so I leave them. Mm -hmm. um, I like I like having them there. So they're beneficial other than the mess and inconvenience they yeah, cause as far as going in and out. They're of the aerial doors. insectivores. They're <laughs> eating flying insects, and anything that does that is okay with me. Okay. <laughs> John from Lecture. Lots of brown dead branches this year on my conifers. They do have deer and rabbits eating the trees, but many of the dead branches were not affected by the animals. I suppose that's one of those they probably should bring into the office the way it sounds. For yeah, you know, it's hard to problem with conifers, a lot of dead branches. When we get the, a lot of dead branches calls, oftentimes that's related to the soil. Uh, poorly drained soils, which we have a lot of in South Dakota, really are a problem with conifers. I mean, one thing you really all need to check is drainage. I mean, it's very easy seeing shelter belts where you go, you watch a line of shelter belts in the low area, suddenly the conifers, the growth just gets very stunted. So always make sure you have good drainage. But usually when I'm looking at dead branches, particularly small trees, it's more often soil related rather than branch related. Okay. Chris, roses. Roses, small orange spots on the top of the leaves and on the bottom, some orange dust. It's probably, well, rust can do mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. rust disease. Uh, again, though, you'd need to prevent that from happening. You can't treat it after the fact. So. Um, Good sanitation too in the fall, getting the, the diseased canes out of there and diseased leaves out of there will help as well. Okay. How poisonous are castor beans? Very. <laughs> <laughs> so don't eat them. Don't, yeah. don't eat them. Yeah. Okay. yeah, don't eat them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, don't eat them. Don't do anything with them. Uh, yeah, it's, they're bad. They're bad. Okay. Uh, KC, finches. They have had a lot of finches this year and have been feeding them. Uh, about a week ago, the finches quit coming. Is there any reason why that might be? Well, uh, yeah, there is a reason. The, the, the birds are, are going into the breeding season, and, and when they do that, they tend to start being, becoming territorial, and, and so uh, by default, they're, they're gonna be at lower densities. And so don't worry about it. The other thing that's going on this time of the year is that they're going through a dietary shift through the winter, the fall and winter and into the spring, they're really focused on carbohydrates to get enough fuel in their tank to go from day to day. Now they're looking for insects uh, because they have higher protein needs 
and so they'll be feeding on other things rather than what you provide them at the feeder. So there's a variety of reasons there. Okay. Chris, question here as far as when is the best time to divide hostas? Is it too late for this spring to do that? Uh, at this point, if, if the leaves are fully unfolded, I don't know. I guess I wouldn't recommend it. If you can get them when they're first coming out of the ground or later, later in the fall after they start to die down a little bit, that's probably best. Um, you might be able to get away with it if you baby it a little bit, keep it really well watered, but, but you're getting to the point now where we're getting into the heat of the summer, especially the last few days. <laughs> okay. Uh, what would be the best type of herbs to plant in your garden? Oh, there's many, many herbs that you can plant in your garden. Anything from uh, basil to sage to marjoram. Some of them are sort of borderline hardy and you may lose them in winter. Rosemary, for example, and lavender I usually tend to lose unless I have them mulched pretty well. But pretty much if it's out there, you can grow it um, for the main culinary purposes that you would have. Uh, John, they have, this is Adrian, Minnesota, a large burning bush, tiny red leaves with thorns, rabbits damage that, that through the winter and part of it has leaves and much of it is without the leaves. Should you cut it back or uh, let it just go as is? Well, you threw me with the thorns, but uh, yeah, I think yeah, if it's a burning bush, you want a musculatus. The other name for that is rabbit candy. Uh, they, that's, it's their favorite. If somebody's watching and say, you know what, I don't have enough rabbits in my yard, uh, they ought to plant this because uh, they'll have fat and happy rabbits. Uh, and so we see a lot of damage on those. And if they've gone and chewed all the way around the base, that top is going to die back. The problem with Euonymus, though, it's one of those few shrubs that when you cut it back, it really doesn't come back very nicely. Um, I'd recommend trying it, cut it back and see what sprouts, but don't be surprised if they're disappointed and find rather than just getting this, this beautiful growth that we get on many of our other shrubs when we cut them back to the ground, you might only get a couple of stems coming up. Uh, that is one plant I strongly recommend protecting it during the winter time from rabbits. You do have to do the wire cage, uh, otherwise they'll find a way to get it and they'll love it. Okay. Chris, green beans, trouble with green beans and aphids. They're eating the leaves. Uh, can you use lime between the rows to keep them away? If not, what suggestions do you have? Okay, well for starters, never use lime in South Dakota. We don't need it. Lime will lower the pH of your soil. So all those garden books out there that tell you to use lime, ignore them, it's not relevant to us. Um, and as far as the control, it, I wouldn't recommend that anyway. Uh, there's, there's different products out there from things like insecticidal soaps to, to chemical products that you can use on aphids. Aphids also you can try to attempt to control just by hosing them off. Uh, but, but just kind of keep scouting, look at those underside of the leaves, um, control them as needed uh, through the season. Okay. Kind of on the same line here as far as the garden from Madison, uh, he does custom rototilling work and has a garden that is very heavy and stays wet. Would it help to add sand, and if so, how much to help dry that up? That's, again, another one we don't recommend. There's, there's too much of a risk of you turning your garden into cement by doing that. We have a lot of times clay-heavy soils, and, and, and so to do that uh, is, is risky, so we don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. The one thing you can do, and you're right, you get, we get concrete if you <laughs> essentially mix sand. In. But the one thing you can do is, is incorporate some organic matter. And mm -hmm. that, that's about the only thing you can really do. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a wet spot in your garden, a little compost and, and till that in would probably be the best way to help change that. Yeah, I think, I think people don't realize just how much sand it really takes. If uh, Jim Gruing, I remember a session he was in, he was saying if you want to loosen up six inches of soil, you have to add at least six inches of sand to that same six inches of soil to even start to loosen it up. So. Actually, the best is you yeah. dig out the soil and just yep. add sand. And just add sand. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they bought a Shasta daisy. The bottom leaves are all wilted uh, where she brought them uh, from. The leaves would open up because they were patched, uh, packed tightly. Would they, would they open up because they were packed so tightly, I guess is what the question is here. Just the way they came. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's a packaging issue. The, yep. the leaves oh. were kind of folded. and Yeah, you get it out and plant it and water it. They usually recover from we'll that. We'll come back. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. Uh, Chris, we're going to give you this one. When is the latest she can plant a full garden veggies from seed? 
Well, there's, you can plant into the middle of the summer, technically. Just you have to look at how many days it's going to take for a plant to mature. So beans could definitely still go in. You could put your uh, cucumbers in. Um, you can do a second planting, a zucchini, you know, at the end of June and still get a crop by the end of the year. So there's many things with short season. Starting tomatoes now, you might have a little bit of problem just starting it by seed. Okay. Uh, from Philip, the grapevine didn't fare very well over the winter. What kind of fertilizer should they use? And I think they're here, they're assuming that the fertilizer will correct any problems the winter uh, caused on their grapevine. Only if they take the fertilizer and the grapevine and move it to France. <laughs> uh, one problem they have is they're, the, essentially the biggest problem they have is they're living in Philip. Uh, and grapes, if they're, most of the grape cultivars that are planted out there are not going to do well. Valent would be a good one to try. Betta is probably the hardiest one out there from Minnesota, and they certainly could do that one. But uh, you got to be very cautious out there selecting grapes for two reasons. One, it's a very, very harsh climate, as I'm sure they know. Uh, the other thing is they're very alkaline soils. Um, the, planting grapes there would certainly be a, a hobby or vocation. Uh, it's it's going to be tough. Okay. Uh, the next question we have came in uh, this week. Um, by a electronic email and it's a slide number three and it's a bug that they're finding in their yard and and Chris I think you took a look at this earlier as far as an idea of what it might be. That uh, is the strawberry root weevil. Uh, it's more of a home nuisance pest I would say than a yard pest. It would maybe uh, attack peonies or strawberry plants but but very do minimal minimal damage but people see them in their house crawling around I, I've had a problem with them too in my home so a um, couple things to just keep in mind. Um, you could use a barrier spray of some sort to prevent them from coming in, but keep your windows screened. Uh, make sure you don't have cracks and crevices. Maybe avoid a lot of excess moisture. They're looking for kind of a moist, shady place, and that's how they end up in your house. All right. Uh, John, can I cultivate under an Ammer maple tree? It's about 15 feet tall and wide, and I want to plant ferns under the outer edges of that. No. Uh, now, now, here's the interesting thing. Had they started cultivating when the tree was young, you can get away with it because tree can adapt to that. I, I've seen it where they've cultivated all around under the tree, but they've been doing it forever. And essentially, the tree develops a root system a little bit deeper than normal because the soils are better aerated. But if you have a plant that's already established, you say, now I'm going to go in there and cultivate and tear it up, you're going to do a tremendous amount of damage to the root system. If they really want to establish ferns, uh, and I get those with ferns and hostas and a number of other plants. The only way you can do it is just hand dig. And if you hand dig in there and, and try to avoid cutting roots that are the size of your thumb or larger, I don't worry about cutting the smaller ones, uh, you should be okay. But really, on, a, on an established plant, hand plant underneath it. Don't go in there with anything, any machinery. When's the best time to prune a smoke tree? Well, smoke trees are summer flowering uh, shrubs. In fact, they'll be kicking in here relatively soon. Seems like summer's coming early this year. Uh, the best time to really prune that was uh, about a month and a half ago. And uh, unless they've got some dead branches they want to remove from it or just a little bit of pruning to shape it, I would say probably not to prune it until next March and then shape it then. Right now, any pruning will remove flower buds. Okay. They have a variegated red dogwood, gnarled and twisted, needs to be replaced. What would work not too tall and on the north side uh, sheltered area of a house? North side sheltered yeah. area of the yeah. house. Um, and if they've got a red gnarled dogwood, and that's <laughs> often the way they look when they get old. You know, one thing I would have suggested was just cut the dogwood back to the ground and let it come back in the spring. Sometimes you end up with a much nicer looking plant than they realize. Uh, the plant I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the Huron dogwood, if they like dogwoods, that's one I would suggest that does well in the north side. It's about a four-foot tall plant. Uh, again, it's very attractive to birds. They're great dogwoods. They, they like the fruit on those. And that would be a nice plant that would have a similar appearance to the dogwood they have now and probably a similar size. So that would be a good choice, and it does well in okay. shaded locations. Kind of a quick answer on this one. Uh, they noticed that there's a number of products, uh, or at least one product, that they notice that's being advertised as far as a pour on around the tree to treat all your insects. Does that work fairly well? No. Uh, it, it will work, but like most things, it's very specific. 
you know, one of the first things is a lot of those chemicals that you pour on around the base of your tree, you do run into problems with, make it tied up in the soil, but you have to make sure you know what insect you're right. controlling. That's Good. key. Thank you, John. And that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Guard Line repeats twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting digital channel. Three also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturday at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find South Dakota Public Broadcasting TV 3. Thanks to our panel of experts this evening, Casey Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences, Chris Dorelstoff from Extension Horticulture Educator from Minneapolis County, Mike Meckning, Extension Weed Specialist, and John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. Thank you to all our phone volunteers, friends of the Garden Line, for taking our, our questions tonight. And thank you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications.